Uh, Ferdinand, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very kind invitation. Uh, good morning to one and all. Uh, having, having collaborated with the Heinrich Boll Foundation on a Syria-related conference with the Atlantic Council several months ago, I was thrilled and honored uh, to be invited by the Foundation to speak at a conference here in Berlin aimed at reviving and encouraging a debate on political approaches to solving the Syrian crisis. I salute the Heinrich Boll Foundation for having taken this excellent initiative. I'm delighted uh, to be exposed to the organization Adopt a Revolution for the first time. My keynote remarks this morning uh, will be brief. I'll try, however, to outline what I think needs to happen to put this horrible conflict on a path toward a political solution. Let me begin with a word, one word, legitimacy. What does it mean in a political sense? To me, it means that a political system is almost unanimously regarded by the people part of and subject to it as rooted in rightness. I may think that President so-and-so is incompetent and foolish, and yet I believe in his right to serve as president. I oppose him politically, but I regard him as serving lawfully. In countries where political legitimacy prevails, virtually the entire population sees things this way. Governments, some effective and some ineffective, come and go, but the system itself is appropriate. It is legitimate. What we are facing today in Syria, and for that matter, in Iraq, are two crises of political illegitimacy bound together by the presence of the so-called Islamic State, or Daesh. In Iraq, there is little dispute that the narrow sectarian policies of former Prime Minister Maliki led a significant part of Iraq's population to regard him and the system he represented as illegitimate, as having no right to exist. Prime Minister Abadi is trying, against difficult odds, to establish a basis for legitimate governance in Iraq. In Syria, the question of legitimacy remains a matter of dispute. Bashar al-Assad routinely claims to lead what he describes as the legitimate government of Syria. And last June, he conducted elections designed to uphold that claim. Clearly, however, there are many Syrians who dispute his right to serve as president Indeed, many of those who dispute his right to serve believe he should hang. And spokespeople for the White House and the State Department routinely say that Mr. Assad, quote, has lost all legitimacy, unquote. Arguments over whether Mr. Assad could win a genuinely free and fair election in my view, missed the point entirely. I have no way of knowing whether or not a majority of Syrians, including four million refugees and upwards of eight million internally displaced, would vote for Mr. Assad. Legitimacy and majoritarianism are two different things in any event. 
for a system to be truly legitimate and therefore truly stable. The rightness of the system must be a matter of popular consensus embracing all but the most marginal and most disturbed of the population. For example, if President Hoff has the support of 70% of the citizenry, but the other 30% wants to see me dancing at the end of a rope, I and the system that produced me have a legitimacy problem. This is obviously a matter of dispute inside Syria, and I would never, as an American, I would never uh, try to take from the hands of Syrians the right to self-determination and self-rule. If a political compromise enjoying broad Syrian support can be reached that leaves Mr. Assad in the presidency for a period of time, who am I to say that this is unacceptable? But I also must say clearly that which I believe very sincerely to be true. Mr. Assad's legitimacy problem is so wide and so deep that he and the regime he represents, meaning the family and the inner circle of enablers, cannot, cannot objectively be part of a legitimate system that fills the governance vacuum Daesh has occupied. Syrian friends of mine, my closest Syrian friends, people I have known literally since the time I was a teenager, my closest Syrian friends, continue to support the Assad regime. They do so because they see no attractive alternative. And yet even they would agree that if the issue is one of establishing legitimate governance for all of Syria, all of it, then the departure of the regime, the family, and its inner circle of enablers must be part of a settlement that keeps in place the institutions of the Syrian Arab government, including the great bulk of security forces that have not engaged in war crimes and crimes against humanity. People such as my closest Syrian friends will not let go of the regime if they think letting go will leave them unprotected. This is particularly true of minorities. What would legitimate governance in Syria look like? First, let's acknowledge that if the fighting stopped tomorrow and a political transition began over the weekend, it would still take years for virtually all Syrians to agree on the political rules of the game in Syria. But it is that consensus on the rules of the game that defines a legitimate system, a system that can be strengthened by good leaders, but also can survive bad ones. It seems to me that if consensus is required, then citizenship is the common denominator for the mosaic of peoples and confessions represented in Syria. Just as the so-called secularism of the past several decades masked underlying political sectarianism, so the Syria of the future cannot be simultaneously sectarian and legitimate. If political power resides in the hands of personalities seeking to impose the dictates or achieve the narrow interests, of a particular sect, the system cannot be legitimate and cannot provide the stability required for human and material reconstruction.
Given what has happened to Syria over the past four years, it is not easy for Syrians who stand for pluralism, inclusivity, rule of law, and empowered citizenship. It is not easy for these people to make their case to anyone. I believe that even after all that has happened, most Syrians would like to be empowered citizens in a civilized republic. But they are mainly unarmed. And for many of them, not living in regime-controlled areas, dodging barrel bombs and evading dash are full-time jobs. Yet I come back to my central point. Dash, or even something worse, cannot be destroyed unless and until the vacuums of political illegitimacy in Iraq and Syria, now occupied by Daesh, are filled with legitimate governance instead. So how do we get to political legitimacy in Syria? Now, clearly we need, first of all, a diplomatic political process that can implement the kind of formula created by the P5 in Geneva in June 2012. The negotiated creation of a transitional governing body on the basis of mutual consent. The practical problem we face today is twofold. One party to the negotiation, the Assad regime, is not currently interested in peace talks. And the other party, the Syrian opposition, is fragmented and highly dysfunctional. Clearly, a third force is needed to change calculations and focus attention. With two co-authors, I recently proposed that the United States expand its anti-Dash train and equip program and create what we call a Syrian National Stabilization Force. Such a force would be triple the size of the personnel objective of the train and equip program. The force's military mission would be to stabilize Syria by defeating any combination of enemies standing between it and the pacification of the country. <laughs> it would take at least two years to build this force, which would initially aim to field three motorized infantry divisions. Elements of this force could be committed much earlier to assist coalition operations against Daesh and to defend against the regime and other extremist elements. Ideally, the announcement of the intention to build such a force would inspire interest in a political track where currently none exists. What we're really talking about here is the creation of what would be the core of a future Syrian army, a force open to the participation of officers and soldiers of the Syrian Arab army who have refused to take part in war crimes and crimes against humanity. To build such a force successfully would, in my view and the views of my co-authors, require the creation of protected zones inside Syria. It would also require mature Syrian input and guidance until a formal Syrian National Command Authority can be built. Speaking personally, and this is not part of our report, I think the best basis for building such a force would involve regional ground forces joining with coalition air forces to sweep Daesh from central and eastern Syria, creating, in effect, the mother of all protected zones. Here, the opposition could form a governmental alternative to the Assad regime and create a credible negotiating counterpart 
for the regime. And although American training would still take place outside of Syria, the National Stabilization Force could be built up rapidly. I want to emphasize that I, I agree totally with those, including the UN Special Envoy, Stefan de Mistura, who are seeking a quick, negotiated end to this conflict. I agree with them entirely. This would be the best outcome for Syria and for all of the people of the region. What I fear, however, is that unless military facts are changed on the ground, the prospect for a negotiated settlement opening a path to political legitimacy in Syria is now and will remain zero. Not 1%, not 5%, not 10%, but zero. I would like to avoid, if at all possible, having a Syrian National Stabilization Force engaging in countrywide combat operations. But unless the capability exists, there will be no motivation for one side in particular to negotiate in good faith. Indeed, even with that combat capability in place, there is no guarantee that the party in question would ever wish to negotiate in good faith. Moreover, there is no guarantee that Iran would permit, much less oblige, its client to negotiate in good faith. In that case, the Syrian National Stabilization Force, ideally operating under a Syrian National Command Authority with the assistance of external allies, would seek to accomplish quickly and completely the military mission set for it. I'll conclude my remarks this morning with three very brief observations. First, notwithstanding the excellent work of European, Syrian, and North American NGOs, the response of the West to the humanitarian abomination that has gripped Syria for over four years has been shamefully inadequate. It is true that those who envisioned and developed the responsibility to protect doctrine did not imagine that the United Nations Security Council would include a permanent member supporting the mass homicide survival strategy of a client. But our collective failure to offer protective measures, measures falling well short of invasion and occupation, will, I think, mystify historians for generations to come. Second, while the West has insisted consistently that there is no military solution for Syria. Iran has worked openly and unapologetically to bring about a military outcome that would implant its client in Western Syria permanently in order to secure Tehran's logistical link to Hezbollah in Lebanon. I would be willing to accept the proposition that there is no military solution for Syria if Western leaders, starting with President Obama, would accept the proposition that diplomatic outcomes tend to reflect military facts on the ground. In my view, the mantra of no military solution has been one excuse among many for failing utterly to protect Syrian civilians. 
And as the Assad regime, as Barbara mentioned, resumes chemical warfare, the need for that protection is clear and present. Third and finally, although I do not rule out the possibility that Western policies may change, even within the 20 months remaining to President Obama, if I were Syrian, I would assume that I am on my own. In the end, it may well be that the building of a legitimate political system embracing all Syrians will require Syrians to count on no one to help them end the violence, bind the wounds, and begin the long process of reconstruction and reconciliation. Perhaps entities as widely dispersed as the Office of the UN Special Envoy, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, and the Atlantic Council can provide safe havens for Syrians of sharply differing political views to meet on a track two basis to discuss the practical security arrangements that would have to precede any serious attempt to negotiate a consensus-based political transition. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for having invited me. More importantly, I would like to thank them for paying attention to Syria and to the horrendous suffering of the Syrian people. And I would like to thank all of you for having listened patiently to my remarks. I look forward to the discussion that will follow. Thank you all very much.